and Sarah Taylor. This is my first time up here on the stage at Movement, so um, thank you for having me today. I am married to Josh, who has spoken here at Movement several times in the last year. Our family actually moved to Columbus last July, and we have been here since then to do a church planning residency here at Movement. So if you don't know, Movement Church uh, was started 11 years ago, and since then they have planted, you have planted, two churches, one in Gahanna called Three Creeks Church, and then Contrast Church in Grandview. And we get to be your third church plant in Sunbury, and we'll be um, being sent out to do that this uh, fall. So we have been in a year of training. We've been uh, gathering a launch team. Actually, several families here from Movement have just moved or are about to move up to Sunbury to be part of Bright City Church with us. So if you want to move to Sunbury, we'd welcome that. Or if you know anyone who already lives in that area, please connect them with us. We'd love to have a cup of coffee or have them over for dinner just to share uh, more about our vision and our heart for the city of Sunbury and how to bring the gospel there. So we have three kids. Silas is in second grade. Judah is in kindergarten. Haven is four. And we've just been loving to be settling into Sunbury already, getting to know our neighbors, getting to know the community. Our kids are in the school up there. It's been great. Personally, I have the, I guess, official title of Director of Discipleship of Bright City Church. And basically what that means is that um, our church's vision of we want people to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus and do what Jesus did. And I get to help our people do that, to learn what it is to um, walk with Jesus every day, to um, become more like him and then live out Jesus' call on our lives every day. So we're really excited to see what God is gonna do in and through us as we plant Bright City Church in the next couple months. But today, I get to be here with you guys and I'm so excited about the series we've been in in the book of Exodus, which is the Israelites' journey to freedom. It's the second book of the Old Testament. And we've been saying that Exodus is God's greatest rescuing work in the Old Testament. In week one, my husband Josh introduced us to an Israelite who was living in the Egyptian palace. His name was Moses. He ended up running from Egypt and living for 40 years in the desert working for his father-in-law. At that point, God showed up in the form of a burning bush and called him to return to Egypt to rescue his people, the Israelites, from slavery. The big idea that week was that God knows who he's calling and he goes with those he is calling. And then last week, Pastor Mark shared with us how that plan of rescue actually worked out. So Moses returned to Egypt and Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go. So God brought on 10 plagues and after each one, God gave Moses the chance to, or not Moses, he gave Pharaoh a chance to release the Israelites, but his heart was continually hardened. So eventually the 10th plague happened, which is known as the Passover, which is still a holiday celebrated in Jewish tradition today. And that was just that every household was supposed to sacrifice a lamb and spread blood across the doorpost entering into their home. Any home that did not have that sign, the firstborn son would be killed. And so Pharaoh's did not spread blood across his doorpost. And so his first son um, was killed. And in that grief, Pharaoh finally relented and released the Israelites. So last week, our big idea was that God rescues his people when they trust and obey him. And today, we're gonna pick up in Exodus 13 through 14 on page 43. And we're gonna see that God is not done rescuing his People. The Israelites are actually going to need rescued over and over again on their journey. But today we're going to pick up just a few days after they leave Egypt and see how God rescues them again. They have just seen that these plagues, these miracles that God did um, resulted in their freedom. And they learned that this God that they had grown up, grow, grew up, grown up, there, there's the word, this God that they have grown up hearing about is who he says he is. And he does what he says he will do. And they have spent, Israel has spent 400 years in slavery. So this generation of Israelites, this is all they've ever known. They were born into slavery and now they've just been freed from a lifetime of slavery. So they're leaving Egypt and they are going to what we call the promised land. So it's called that, it's the land of Canaan. There's a picture, I don't know if it's going up there, but there's a picture of a map that will show us um, the, this promised land, Canaan. And this was promised back in Genesis 15 to a man named Abraham. He was promised 
God and Abraham made a covenant where Abraham's descendants were gonna be God's chosen people, and this became, generations later, the people of Israel. So they have been in slavery for 400 years, and they are headed back to this land that God promised them. But you can see on the next map, this has a little bit of a better picture of it. There's another map. Um, (laughs) That uh, if they took the most direct route, they would go from Egypt, which is over here, up along the Great Sea to Canaan. You can see the circle of the land of Canaan. And they would have to go through this little place called Philistines. That's the Philistine territory. So the Philistines were a war-hungry people. They loved fighting. And God says in, verse, in chapter 13, verse 17, he says that if the people are faced with battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And you can see that red line. It's a really roundabout way. The fascinating thing to me is that if they would have gone along the Great Sea, they, that journey would have taken 11 days. That's less than two weeks. But... As we would find out as we continue to study Exodus, the journey actually takes them over 40 years. That is a big difference. But I think that God knew not only did he not want them to run back in the first, in face of the first battle, but he also knew they had a lot to learn in those 40 years. So back to our story. They're on this emotional high. They're leaving Egypt. They've been enslaved for 400 years. Now they are finally free and they are just ready to follow God wherever he goes, wherever he leads them. So they camp at Succoth, then they camp in this place called Etham. And in that place, that is where it says that God's presence showed up in the form of a pillar of cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night. And that really was just to remind them, be a physical reminder that God was with them and he was leading them. So they are just feeling invincible, ready to follow this cloud wherever they go, 400 years of slavery, a little journey to Canaan would be nothing. They don't know it's gonna take them 40 years at this point. So they're just ready to follow and they're excited. And then chapter 14 begins. God shares his plan with Moses, which I find interesting because I have yet to get this prior and privileged information from the Lord when uh, he works in unexpected ways. But in verse two of chapter 14, says the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Pi, camp by Pi Haharoth between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore across from Baal Siphon. Then Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. So God tells Moses this prior and privileged information, probably because he knows that there's gonna need to be someone who already has a heads up of what's gonna happen. But it all plays out as God says. So Pharaoh is back in Egypt, still grieving his son. He actually doesn't even realize that the Israelites have left. And then someone comes and tells him, so the Israelites are gone, and he completely panics. He changes his mind. He regrets that he let them leave. And in verse, sorry, in, sorry, in verse five, says, when word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done? Letting all those Israelites' slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots, along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so he chased after the people of Israel who had left with their fists raised in defiance. So I looked back a couple chapters, and in chapter 12, it says there were 600,000 Israelite men, so that doesn't even count women and children, that were enslaved in Egypt, and they all left. 600,000 workers just left. This was bad news for the Egyptian economy, that if you know anything, if you had a factory with thousands of people and they leave, that factory is not gonna stay open. So the, the Israelite slaves were what ran. They did all the grunt work to run the Egyptian economy and they are now gone. And so Pharaoh is in complete regret and willing to use his entire army, all of his military resources to bring them back. So they take off. But at this time, 
the Israelites, still on their emotional high, they're relishing in their freedom, camping along the shores of the Red Sea, enjoying the view, and then all of a sudden they look up and they see this massive dust cloud. I mean, 600 plus chariots, right? Coming through the desert is going to create a massive dust cloud. So they look up, they see this, they see the army coming at them and they completely panic. All of a sudden that beautiful view of the Red Sea turns into a dead end. It feels like a trap. They are so confused. It says that they cry out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here? Verse 10 and 11. Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said leave us alone, let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. This is the first moment that they regret leaving Egypt. And they are confused. They do not understand why God would have rescued them from slavery just to bring them out here to leave them to die in the wilderness. They were like, they're asking questions like, did we hear God wrong? Did, were we not following the right cloud? Why are we, why did he lead us to this trap? And they express it as anger at Moses, but really they're questioning God's guidance. They were at a dead end. So I know two weeks ago, Josh talked about a little bit about our story and different points where we were so sure that God was clearly calling us to something as a family. Well, one of those moments actually did not play out like we thought it would. So nine years ago, we were living in Wisconsin. We, uh, I was working my dream job. Josh was a youth intern at our church, and he, we knew there was plans in the works to promote him to youth pastor. And so in that time, all of a sudden, we started to feel a stirring and felt very clearly God was calling us to move to Akron, Ohio, where there was a church that had a residency program where you could go to seminary and you could train to be a pastor and they would help you through all that. At the time, there was a worship residency position open and if you don't know this about Josh, part of, a big part of his story is worship. He led worship all through high school and um, that's just been a big piece of his story. He can play pretty much any instrument up here. Uh, you can ask him to do that later. But um, so we were like, this is a good fit. This is the right move. God's calling us to this. I was seven months pregnant at the time with our oldest. So we were like, this will also take us closer to family. My sister lived in Akron and the rest of our family were just in a couple hours drive, which was not the case in Wisconsin. So it felt like the right move. So we, um, Josh had a few phone interviews a job offer was not given yet, but we felt confident this is where God was leading. So we packed up our moving truck, we drove to Akron, moved all our stuff into my sister's garage, we're living in her guest room, and two days later, Josh gets called into a meeting at the church and they said, it's not a win-win, we're not gonna offer you the job. We felt at a dead end. And I think that all of us have stories like that, where we feel like, we're stuck, and I would define a dead end moment as a place where we feel lost, confused, and stuck, unable to see a way out. We all have a normal response or a natural tendency, a way we cope in these situations. Maybe you're stuck in a bad job and you, don't, you just want out, but you don't see a way out. You don't have another job lined up, so you just quietly quit. Or you're just looking, biding your time, doing the bare minimum until you can get out. We're tempted to run away, to take the next opportunity that comes even if it's not what's best. We want to go back to what is familiar or safe, forgetting that the good old days weren't really all that good, that if we're honest, there was hard things back then, but those hard things pale in comparison to the present hard, we forget about them, right? Today, I want us to see our dead end seasons differently. I want us to let go of our need for control and realize that dead ends make us see our need for God. Josh and I spent that evening after that meeting sitting in my sister's guest room crying out to God. We were confused. We were lost. We were broken. I was seven months pregnant. We, had, we were in a new city with no job and no home and no medical insurance. So there was a bit of panic for sure. We were asking a lot of the same questions that the Israelites asked. Did we, did we miss it? Did we hear God wrong? Were we not supposed to come? Can we go back to Wisconsin? Is that job still f available? 
And even at, at points, we questioned if we were called to church ministry. Was this for us? Is this what God wanted us to pursue? And the Israelites are in this place. They're seeing their need for God. They're, it said that they all cried out to God at the same time. And then Moses steps up to calm them. Remember, Moses already knew this was gonna happen. God let him know. No. Moses says in verse 13, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. We all need someone like this in our life, someone who will speak truth in love to us, who will help us see a different perspective when we can't see the next step in front of us. Moses was this voice of reason. He helped the Israelites calm down so they could see what God was going to do. But then once they were calm, God didn't just show them what he was going to do. He asked them to take a step of obedience. So verse 15 continues. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. They didn't see that come in. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. When we stop panicking and we look to God in those moments, he guides our next steps. God was saying that it wasn't just about watching him work, it also required a step of obedience. Raise the staff, step out into the sea. We ought to let go of control and give God space to work and then follow him in obedience. God is going to rescue the Israelites, but God's rescue isn't always what we expect. So to continue the story, that pillar of cloud that was currently between them and the sea, because that's the direction they, it was leading them, it moved to behind them, not so they would turn around, but that it would be a hedge of protection between them and the Egyptian army. And it brought that battle that the Egyptians were ready to fight to a halt. And then that cloud turned to a fire. There was no way the army was gonna try to break through that fire to get to the Israelites. So everything kind of came to a standstill. And that God told Moses to go over, put his staff over the sea. And when he did that, a wind started to blow. It pushed the waters up and it, it continued to blow to dry the path so that they could walk through on solid ground. Once it was ready, the Israelites started walking across the sea. And suddenly the Egyptians see this happening and they panic that their economy is going to continually struggle because the Israelites are getting away. So they chase them into the middle of the sea. I'm sure at this moment, the Israelites are feeling that panic again, picking up their pace, picking up their kids, walking faster with them, trying to beat the Egyptians across. When God looks down, because he's the one fighting for them, he looks down and he sees the Egyptian army chasing them and says he brings confusion to their forces. Verse 25 says, he twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. And the Egyptians now, it's their turn to panic. They say, let's get out of here, away from these Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. They're like, oh yeah, remember those plagues? Remember what God did to us and all that suffering that we endured? He's still fighting for them and this is bad news for us. We gotta get out of here. And they try to retreat, but it doesn't work because their chariot wheels are twisted. And the last Israelite steps over to dry land on the other side, and God says to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again, then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. I guarantee there's no delay here. Moses raises his staff over the water, the water comes crashing back down, it says it returns to normal, and all of the Egyptian army was stuck in the middle of the sea, and the entire army died. Verse 29 wraps up our story. It says, but the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground. As the water stood up like a wall on both sides, that is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. 
It was at this point that they realized they weren't just rescued from the land of Egypt, they were rescued from the forever from the threat of the Egyptians. God rescued them in a way that no one expected. I personally don't like the unexpected. I don't like to walk into social situations without proper expectations. I want to know what we're doing, who's gonna be there, what are we eating, what do I need to wear? I don't like to walk into situations if I don't have ex right expectations. It makes me nervous. Josh, I tell him all the time that I like surprises, but then Christmas or my birthday rolls around and I can't help myself from trying to figure out what he's gonna get me. It's just in me, I want to know, I want to figure it out. And I do this with God. I want to do God's job for him. We're going th if we're going through a season where I don't know what's next or I know he's doing something, I'm trying to figure out what he's doing or how he's gonna work it all out. I'm trying to tell him, this is, this is the way that is best, God. Shouldn't you do this? I'm trying to do his job for him because I don't like unexpected things. I think most of us don't. But the more I learn to trust God, the more I'm humbled in that I can't do his job for him, the more I actually see that his way is better and it's far better than I could ever imagine or that I could accomplish on my own. The Israelites could have won the war. The Egyptians could have attacked. They, God could have empowered them to defeat them, but lives would have been lost and they would have carried the trauma of war with them for the rest of their journey or the Egyptians could have never even come after them, but then they would have lived the rest of this journey always in the back of their heads wondering, when are the Egyptians gonna wake up and realize that we left and want us back? But now God worked on their behalf in a way that eliminated the threat of the Egyptians and it spared every single Israelite life. In our family story, Josh got a job in the marketplace, we got a home, we got medical insurance, all before our son was born. God worked things out to provide for us. And then almost exactly to the day, a year later, Josh was offered a residency at that same church, this time in the life group ministry. Now, it took me back to remembering while he was at that meeting where they said it wasn't a win-win, I was at my sister's house having a conversation with my brother-in-law. And in that conversation, I remembered saying, man, I'm really excited about this job. I know Josh will be good at it. Really excited about his schooling and all that. But I'm just kind of disappointed that in the worship residency, he won't really get opportunities to preach because I know that's a passion of his. And that's true. The worship residency would have been a niche of learning how to be a worship pastor, how to do creative arts ministry. But in the life group ministry, he had a much broader residency. He had opportunities to preach at churches all over our area. He had opportunities to counsel people, to learn how to do funerals or weddings, to really learn how to do almost every area of church ministry. We got to even do a lot of it together, where if he would have been in worship ministry, he would have been doing a lot up here, and I would not have been up here. So we got to actually even do ministry together in that area. And honestly, I can tell you now, nine years later, looking back, that if he would have gotten the worship residency, I don't think we'd be planning Bright City Church. I don't know that we would have been going down the route of church planning. Worship would have taken us a completely different route in ministry. And so now we can see God's hand and why he worked it out how he did. But at the time, it was really confusing and we didn't understand. And I'm reminded of Isaiah 55, eight and nine. that says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's a humbling thought, that God's ways are always higher. Because with God, our dead ends aren't really dead ends. He always has a plan for our good. I think sometimes we get stuck on Romans 8, 28 though. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We hear that and we're like, okay, I love God. So he's gonna work it all out. But we attach our definition of good. We think it means that anything we ask for, we're gonna get. We think it means that we're, it's gonna be for our physical good and that's the only area we actually look at but we have to continue on in that passage and we have to include verses 29 and 30. And it says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Our good, our ultimate good, isn't always that we get our way or that we get what we want. Our ultimate good is that we become more like Jesus, that we have been called, we have been justified or forgiven, and we will ultimately one day be glorified. Our big idea today is that God uses dead-end moments for our ultimate good. We have to remember that for the Israelites, coming to the Red Sea was just as much a part of God's plan as crossing it. He led them there. You know, those Israelites, they had been born into slavery. They had been born in Egypt. So they had worldviews and ways of life that needed change. But in that moment, they all cried out to God simultaneously. They saw their need. And he needed to bring them to that place where their self-reliance, their feeling of invincibility was kind of crushed so that they could see that it was God who was working and it was God who they needed. So what dead ends are you experiencing right now? Where do you feel lost, confused, or stuck? Is there any area of your life where you're desperately praying for God's rescue? Is it a diagnosis that seems bleak? Or a job opportunity that didn't pan out? A financial crisis that you don't see a way out of? Or a dream that isn't being fulfilled? We don't always get the Red Sea miracle. Even in the darkest valleys, though, he walks with us. Even in our darkest moments, we can trust that God is working in us. Earlier in Romans 8, it says, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will, re will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. We live in a broken world. God didn't create it that way though. It's not supposed to be this way. God, at the beginning of time, God created Adam and Eve without sin, but they chose to rebel against God's plan and sin enter, to the, enter the world and with that brokenness. But at that moment, God started a plan to bring Jesus to take our place for our sin, to die on the cross for us, to restore all things one day. So we say that Exodus was the greatest rescuing work in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, when Jesus comes and dies for us on the cross and rises again, that is actually the greatest rescuing work of all time because he is in the process now of restoring this world that one day we will all experience as we choose to follow Jesus an ultimate rescue for our ultimate good. I have those stories too. I didn't have time to share them today. And honestly, they're harder to talk about where I can't look back and be like, oh yeah, that's why God did that. Where I actually have come to a place where I know that there's things that I desperately prayed for that God said no, that he said not in this life. But even though I can't take away your pain right now, or I won't take away your pain right now, I will walk with you through it. I will never abandon you. Will you trust God even when it doesn't make sense? Will you surrender your plan for his? Will you let God do his good work in you? In our dead ends, I want to challenge us today to stop trying to escape it. Stop running away or wanting to return to what feels familiar or safe, but instead run to Jesus because he is the only source of ultimate rescue, the only one can, who can bring about our ultimate good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are the same God today with the same power that parted the Red Sea. You are the same God at work in our life. I thank you for those moments where we get our Red Sea miracle, where we have something that we can say, this is only God, and he 
showed us that miracle here, right now, in this moment. But God, I pray for those that are still waiting for their miracle or who know that that miracle won't be on this earth, that we would feel your nearness, that we would know your love and your comfort, that we would know that you never leave us and that because of Jesus, we have hope. We don't have to live hopeless. We have hope that you are working all things for our ultimate good and that one day you will make all things new. I pray for anyone in this room that hasn't surrendered to you, that they would do that today and that you would meet them where they're at and remind them that they are not alone. You are right here and you just want them to turn to you. Thank you that you love us. We love you. Amen.